Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome everyone to the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Charles Cook of National Review is in for Jim Garrity today. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Good, bad, and crazy martinis for you as usual. And Charlie, we start with the good, and it's a story of criminal activity being discovered by the FBI. It comes to us from the state of California, and this is from the Associated Press. A California state senator who authored gun control legislation asked for campaign donations in exchange for introducing an undercover FBI agent to an arms trafficker, according to court documents unsealed on Wednesday. The allegations against California State Senator Leland Yee were outlined in an FBI criminal complaint that names 25 other defendants, including Raymond Chow, who is a gang leader in San Francisco's Chinatown, who's known as Shrimp Boy. Yee is also accused of accepting tens of thousands of dollars in campaign contributions and cash payments to provide introductions, help a client get a contract, and influence legislation. But here's the big part. Investigators said Yee discussed helping the agent get weapons worth $500,000 to $2.5 million, including shoulder-fired missiles, and explained the entire process of acquiring them from a Muslim separatist group in the Philippines to bringing them to the United States, all this according to the FBI. So for a guy who hates guns, Charlie, he's pretty comfortable working with them. Well, it should probably be explained why this is the good martini, <laughs> given how ugly that story is. And in my view, it is necessary from time to time to be reminded that politicians and government are people, ultimately, and that there's nothing special about our age. We're often led to believe, and unfortunately, voters and participants in civil society seem to be susceptible to believing that we've put this sort of thing behind us, that man is perfectible, and that in the 21st century, we're unlikely to need protections that we enjoy, including the Second Amendment, including the First Amendment, which we'll come to in a little bit. And that simply isn't the case. Now, a huge number of legislators are, of course, nothing like Leland G, thankfully. But there are bad eggs. And it is, frankly, astonishing that somebody who said that there was no debate and no discussion over whether Californians should be allowed to own so-called assault weapons, otherwise known as rifles that look slightly different than other rifles, would be trafficking in missile launchers, in fully automatic weapons. And while he was trying to take weapons away from his constituents, putting them in the hands of criminals and people he believed to be in the mafia. In the last case, it was in fact an FBI agent. When conservatives stand up and say, we don't trust the federal government, it helps occasionally to have a scandal like the NSA or the IRS come up. And similarly with gun control, of course, a lot of gun control advocates are nothing like Leland G. but their argument does rely on trust the government, and we can't. We basically read the first four paragraphs of this, and of course, nowhere in there does it mention what party he is. In fact, you have to Read all the way down in the AP version of the story to paragraph 16, Charlie, to find out that Democrats want him to step down. You don't find out till paragraph 24 that he is actually a Democrat. What do you make of the difference in citing party affiliation between this scandal and some that have affected Republicans at the state or national level? Yeah, I compared the scandal involving Bob Filner, the Democratic mayor of San Diego, who was forced to resign on sexual assault charges with Republican scandals from 2006. I did this a while ago, and it was fascinating reading the New York Times articles on both stories. Filner was mentioned as a Democrat in about 2,000 words three times. Not only are Republicans generally referred to immediately as Republicans, but the stories focus in on what other Republicans think about this Republican and what Republican voters are going to think of their Republicans and what the Republican House and Republican Senate (laughs) and Republican leadership is going to do about these Republicans who have done these Republican things. If you go back to 2006, which was a brutal year for Republicans, they lost both the House and the Senate in the midterms, there were a series of scandals that really didn't help them. 
uh, the Abramov scandal was, I think, the most famous. It does seem as if Democrats have had a bad week. It's not just this Democrat in California, but it's the Democratic mayor of Charlotte. It's also Harry Reid, who is embroiled in a scandal of his own, funneling campaign money to his granddaughter. The number seems to go up all the time. When I went to bed last night, it was $16,000. This morning, it seems to be thirty-one. You do get this with governments. This is not a partisan point. This is what happens. It happens in England. It happens in France. It happens in the United States when people have been in power for too long, either at the federal level or because a city like Charlotte just elects Democrats, as California seems to as well. You get complacency and you get corruption. And it's coming at a very bad time for the Democratic Party, as it did for Republicans in 2006. All right. You mentioned uh, the First Amendment was also on the docket today, and that is in the bad martini. And that's because the Senate's media shield law appears to be somewhat close to passage. Chuck Schumer, who is the sponsor of this, which should always set off a red flag for conservatives, says he's got the 60 votes to uh, break a filibuster. John Cornyn, the number two Republican, says that's not true. If he had the votes, they would have already done it. Basically, according to Breitbart.com, Schumer's proposal would exempt a covered journalist from subpoenas and other legal requirements to expose their confidential sources in leak investigations and other areas. Other lawmakers have proposed similar ideas in the past, but the effort gained new momentum after a series of revelations about controversial tactics at the Justice Department uh, that it was using to target journalists, including James Rosen and the Associated Press. Cornyn says that's a bunch of malarkey. He says they want to pick and choose which journalists are covered. In other words, if you're a blogger, they might not cover you. But if you work for The New York Times, they might. Given the changes in the way we get information and the way we consume news, that really smacks to me, in essence, of government licensing who's an official journalist for the purposes of a Shia law and who's not. If there's one thing I can glean from the First Amendment is that the government should not be in the business of licensing the news media. So, uh, Charlie, how concerned should we be that if they don't have the 60 votes, they're pretty darn close, it seems? Well, I think we should be concerned. I think we should be concerned any time that a government seeks to involve itself in any way with the press. And I was concerned at this story, which thankfully seems to have been killed, but this story that the federal government wanted to do a survey uh, of the news media in order to find out how best to serve the public. This is, of course, an argument that we're used to with the fairness doctrine in which the government find outfits that it thought weren't providing balance. The government should have absolutely nothing whatsoever in any way to do with the press or to do with free speech. Cornyn is right. This is a law that seeks to distinguish between an American citizen who is standing on a street corner or who maybe has a WordPress blog and somebody who works for the New York Times or, say, for National Review. There's nothing in the First Amendment that allows that. But even if there were, there is no reason for a free society to behave like that. And it should be said that the United States is an outlier on the question of free speech. It's extremely virtuous in the way that it treats its citizens. It is different than every country in the world. Their protections here are stellar. But there is one exception to this, and that is that the United States actually has a journalist visa for employment. And that's not something that you particularly want a federal government to be involving itself in. In order to get one, you have to prove at the embassy in your country that you are an accredited journalist, which means generally joining a union, and that you have the backing of what the United States considers to be an acceptable news organization. So there is a precedent here for determining who is a journalist and who is not. And if you try and come into the country without a journalist visa and say you write a story, you can be deported. I think Cornyn is right to bring this up. Let's move to Harry Reid, who's no stranger to the crazy martini. Yesterday, he was part of the Democratic effort to roll out their agenda for 2014. Can't remember the title of it right now, and apparently neither can anybody else in the press because they got zero questions on it. They got all their questions on Obamacare and other controversial issues. Of course, the Obama questions came just one day after the administration admitted that they were going to essentially allow an extension for anyone who's begun the process of enrollment in Obamacare past the March 31st deadline. But Harry Reid says he understands why there needs to be an extension. And it basically comes down to Internet illiteracy. Here's what he said. There are some people who are not like my grandchildren who can handle everything so easily on the Internet. 
And these people need a little extra time. It's not uh, the example they gave is a 63 year old woman came in to the store and she said, I almost got it. But every time I, all, I just about got there, it would cut me off. We have a lot of people just like this, no, through no fault of the internet, because people are not educated how to use the internet. Charlie, you buying that? No, this is clearly a problem of demand. But uh, even if it weren't, you, you have to ask the question then why did you roll out an internet based healthcare system? It <laughs> strikes me that he can't win however he plays it. If he acknowledges that the reason Obamacare has been a disaster is because, firstly, there just doesn't seem to be the demand that the left believed there would be, and secondly, the website was badly designed, then you would have to acknowledge that it hasn't gone very well. And if your argument is that the reason it hasn't gone very well is because the people are not capable of using it, then you have to ask why a government that had three years to implement this chose to do it in the way that it did. I presume Harry Reid knew this three years ago. It's not as if the internet illiteracy is rising, it's declining. <laughs> so when the website started to be put together, you would have expected him to speak up. Why didn't he? Well, the question that rattled around in my head is that right now, the number of young and healthy people that they need to sign up to defray the costs here is pretty far below the uh, projections that they need. It's about 25% as opposed to about 40%. So this thing doesn't implode on itself right away. So if those are the people who aren't signing up, is he really trying to make us believe that those yeah. are the people who can't navigate a website? That's an extremely good point. The numbers don't work for the government in large part because it seems to be older people just before Medicare who've signed up, not the young people. So you're absolutely right. I would just finish by saying that this is, of course the least absurd thing that Harry Reid has said in the last week. <laughs> I mean, the ongoing Emmanuel Goldstein, Goldstein tactic that has been shown towards the Koch brothers, a couple of people who most Americans have never heard of, is up there. The most preposterous thing that Harry Reid said this week was that Republicans' refusal to agree to every provision of a democratic bill on Ukraine caused the invasion of Crimea. Uh, one has to wonder whether he's losing his mind. And in that clip you played, he sounded, at least in relation to what we've heard in other areas, relatively lucid. If that's a good day for Harry Reid, that's just not good for the country or the people of Nevada. And if Jim were here, I'm sure he would say, way to go, Nevada. Way to go. So, <laughs> yes. Ch Charlie, as always, great to have you with us. We'll talk to you soon. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Charlie Cook of National Review in for Jim Garrity today. Jim will be back tomorrow along with Brett Winterbull, who will be in for me. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And tune in tomorrow for the Friday edition of the Three Martini Lunch.